This is going to be a weird, uh, all over the place ramble. Uh, <laughs> wow. Um, I've gone from smiles to almost tears uh, in, in about the last hour, um, just all over the place, thinking about uh, certain issues. And uh, it's so weird that we're not even drinking Mountain Dew. Um, I need to cut down on some caffeine to make this video, so we're going with Sprite. Um, sorry, Misty. Uh, so, oh, those of you who learn a shit ton of things from this video will probably be um, happy that there are YouTubers like me who have been around for a very long time and have a long memory. Um, because I'll be drawing on this memory uh, to deal with some recent events. Um, so, to begin with, this video is a response to uh, Sophia Speaks and three videos in particular. Um, we're drawing from Richard Coughlin Has Made Me Feel Uncomfortable, uh, primarily, but also the 100 subscriber Q&A and Sophia's transition vlog episode one, one month of therapy. Um, so this is also, this video is dedicated to, uh, Laura Soros, um, Laura S, because, uh, she was one of the people who commented on the 100 subscriber Q&A, uh, and that was to ask if Sophia Speaks had, uh, other channels with content that Laura could go check out, and one of the channels that Laura found was Pragmatic Uselessness. Now, I happen to know that Sophia, as we know her now, um, has had many, many channels, and this goes to the, the video, which is uh, Richard Coughlin Has Made Me Feel Uncomfortable, where Sophia said, that Richard and Sophia were acquaintances, and that that was important to know. Context here, though, um, from my point of view, uh, they were more than uh, your normal acquaintances. Um, that's like saying that anyone who's had a long-term relationship uh, of making you know, comments back and forth over the span of, say, five or six years, is just an acquaintance. This is a long-term thing uh, between Richard and Sophia. And I want to take you all back to um, six years ago. <laughs> this is this is what it takes to, to really explain the context of what I want to say here. Six fucking years ago, Richard Coughlin on YouTube comes up with an idea. And that idea is the Ponage Olympics. Now at the time, Ponage was a term that was used by many, and uh, Coughlin used the term in, in a sense of taking someone's argument and showing it to be wrong, whilst also inserting a little bit of flair in the form of, you know, insults or uh, looking down on a person, you know, personality. But at its core, uh, Coughlin wanted it to be taking somebody who's wrong on the internet and showing their arguments to be wrong, to be bad. So if you didn't do that, you uh, were not actually doing ponage, you were just uh, speaking an opinion. So he creates this Ponage Olympics, and it was clear that uh, half of the participants, which numbered in the hundreds, half of the participants uh, still weren't getting that uh, it wasn't just about bullying and using insults. You had to actually address the person's argument and explain why they were wrong. 
But uh, after a while, for his own reasons, he stopped doing that Ponage Olympics. Now, in the Ponage Olympics, there were some Ponage artists that were really great. Okay? Um, I entered and never won any category whatsoever. Um, the most I won from it was a tweet by Richard Coughlin, which gained me about 50 subscribers way back in the day. Um, and that was for being a good sport about having not won anything. I even had one year, one of my Ponage videos that I entered in uh, one of the Olympics, the next year someone plagiarized my Ponage video and won his category, right? And everyone praised that person. I was, I was upset about that. Um, but through through all of the the greatness and and not so greatness that the Ponage Olympics created, and the conversation about cyberbullying, um, throughout that there were a, a couple of people who really stood out as Ponage artists. One of which was a, a teenage boy named White Lightning 1161. And White Lightning 1161 was a pioneer of a certain uh, tactic of playing someone's video and at certain points in the video using a keyboard and hitting the space bar to stop their video. And then hitting the space bar again to restart it, to insert his own voice into their video, uh, much like you would see somebody uh, today who would who would use uh, tactics like that, like say Sargon of Akkad, who pauses the video to let his own voice be heard and then lets the video resume. Uh, White Lightning 161 would just have the camera on him, just like you're seeing me right now, play the video on his computer, and do it live, and do it in one take. And he would really rip a lot of people apart. Um, most of the people he talked about were uh, theists, um, people who were what we would now consider to be low-hanging fruit. Um, it was a different YouTube six years ago. The frontier was wilder. So, uh, around February of 2011, something happened, and White Lightning 1161's channel uh, disappeared. And there is a youtube aside video on my channel about that. Um, by the way, it's, it's important that uh, I say that my YouTube Aside series covers YouTube Aside because I feel like not only does one side of a conversation go away um, because response videos to people were basically responding to nothing, but also um, sometimes YouTube Aside can be a symptom of a larger problem that could lead to other uh, larger issues than just that. So when people start deleting their accounts, I worry. Um, so I did in this case, and I reached out to uh, White Lightning 1161 in every way that I could, and uh, came to find out um, some things, which were later put in videos on other channels. Um, basically, White Lightning 1161 was living at home, and someone had alerted his family to the fact that he had put out basically anti-theist, atheist videos on YouTube. And his family uh, grounded him from the internet and forced him to delete his White Lightning 1161 account, which was a very depressing thing. And the only way that I was able to get in touch with him was by a smuggled phone that was uh, in his bedroom that was hidden from parents. And so I was trying to give uh, 
my support to him for a while, as well as other people. Now, after White Lightning 1161 moved out of that horrible family situation of being, you know, gay and atheist in uh, a family that don't accept either, uh, and when I say gay, I mean the, the wider umbrella of anything that's not straight, um, being LGBT <laughs> and uh, atheist, um, because there's more to the story later, right? Um, so later, uh, a bunch of channels popped up after uh, he at the time, and, and I'm sorry about pronoun use, but sometimes my memory won't allow me to retrofit um, the right pronouns, especially when, um, as the story unfolds, uh, pronoun use and uh, gendered terms use is a soft. It's it's a soft spot here, and it's a sore subject. Um, so a after, uh, it seems like it was almost a year. A couple of channels popped up that were still in the same uh, anti-theist sort of uh, bent, but they weren't getting as many subscribers because YouTube as a whole kind of changed to not value the Ponage artist as much. But uh, he kept making videos, and a couple other channels went down. And I was always wondering, like, what what is it with this starting a new channel and taking it down, starting a new channel, taking it down? Well, part of that story can be seen in the uh, the Q and A and the uh, the other videos by Sophia Speaks that you can see below. Um, Sophia says that she basically decided to, to not be as angry, and, and the anger and the uh, resentfulness towards uh, religion has dissipated. Dissipated was the word that she used. So, um, knowing this history, knowing that this is a person who uh, had participated in in Coughlin's Ponage Olympics to the point where this was a shining star of the Ponage Olympics, right? This was a good example of what Ponage was supposed to be. You know, entertaining ways to learn that somebody is wrong. Um, and then knowing the horrible situation that happened in White Lightning 1161's family life that really uh, it, it would scar anyone. And on top of other things that came out in uh, later videos that uh, he had been forced to go to uh, homeschooling because of bullying at school. And so uh, he was basically pulled out of the, the friendship network of public school uh, and uh, going to you know private style schooling and removed from uh, all of the internet friends that were you know fans of the one one six one channel. That that was just a horrible thing to see anyone have to go through, and many of us atheists really feel for people who have to grow up in a religious family and resent it and, and just want to get out on their own, you know, and, and they have to stick it out, you know, from the day that they realize that they're not the same uh, religious orientation as their parents to the day that they finally get to liberate themselves and move out. So knowing this, and then watching... Sophia's video, Richard Coughlin has made me feel uncomfortable. I felt bad for both parties because I know that um, Richard, in using terms like sweetie and honey, after learning that White Lightning 1161 was transitioning into Sophia Speaks, 
and knowing this long history, I know that Richard was probably using those terms, sweetie, honey, and, and whatnot, in order to try to insert an unsaid, I'm okay with you being trans. You know? And it's an awkward position that uh, cisgendered white male people get put in when you want to say, I love you for whoever you are, and you want to, like, start using the right pronouns, the right terms, and sometimes it it's a little belabored. It seems a little strained when you say it, because um, pronoun switching is hard after knowing someone for a very long time. And then I don't think that uh, Richard was at all trying to hit on someone in another country who's in the middle of a transition by saying sweetie or honey. I think he was in that position of just wanting to show acceptance. And now that you've all heard a little bit of the, the background story of what was known about White Lightning 1161, you might understand how Richard Coughlin would want to use terms that engender acceptance. You know, he's trying to be uh, an accepting person where this person has had no one in the world uh, accept them in the, in their real life, you know. And here I, I just use the word there because I'm stuck between she and he. <laughs> um, it's it's a difficult spot. So uh, Sophia speaks makes makes a video screen capping um, what she said made her feel uncomfortable. And when I saw that, I just I was sad for both parties, you know. Richard's here trying to be a friend and losing a friend by trying too hard, you know, and genuinely trying to show that he accepts uh, Sophia for who she is. And so 16 years ago, I took in a cat in my house. It was a stray cat, and we called the cat Nipples because it was well endowed, and it probably just had a litter of kittens that all died out in the cold, and it was a, it was a horribly strayed cat, and it was screwed up in the head, and every time I would try to pet this cat, it would seem to want my affection, right? But then it would turn over on its back, use its claws to grab my hand, and then start biting. And it wasn't doing that because it thought that it was being attacked or anything. It just didn't know how to accept affection. You know? So I went and got a leather glove. You know, a really good one. And I would pet my cat nipples um, with the leather glove. Until nipples learned that... Uh, yeah, you can just sit there and, and accept love and not have to be so defensive. And, you know, I think this this is a, a similar case where Coughlin was just trying to be accepting and Sophia didn't know how to accept acceptance. And that's sad. It's not... A failing on either one of their parts that I that I want to blame anyone for. It's just sad, you know. And I hope that uh, they can come to terms uh, in 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 the sense of their own friendship, which has spanned years of being acquaintances. Um, Yeah. No caffeine for me for a while. <laughs>